So today is actually the third annual economic forum, but it is the first that we have a specific theme. So today's theme is talent, and throughout the day, we're going to explore all facets of that topic. And really looking at how we're able to develop the people of our region. For it is the people uh, who actually um, are our greatest points of pride. If you think about it in the region, our people are our greatest points of pride. In some ways, we also have our greatest challenges around that topic. But they also offer some of the greatest opportunities that we need to, um, to utilize and to be able to help us realize the full potential. So, you know, it is my pleasure actually to open um, the uh, 2000 South West Virginia Economic Forum and introduce um, a speaker this morning to provide a welcome. And so it's my pleasure to introduce an individual who really understands education and in specifics uh, understands the role that higher education plays in economic development and masterfully leads the University of Virginia's College of Wise. So it's my pleasure to welcome to the podium the Chancellor of the University of Virginia's College of Wise, Donna Henry. What a beautiful day to be in far southwest Virginia. Uh, it's my pleasure to welcome you to the campus of the University of Virginia's College at Wise and to the 2018 Southwest Virginia Economic Forum. As I look around our crowd today, at just over 400 friends, neighbors, and colleagues in attendance, it's such a gratifying scene. Seeing you today reminds me of just how special this place really is. Um, I'd also like to welcome some uh, dignitaries who are with us today. Uh, Stephen Moray, who is the COO of Virginia Economic Development Partnership, is with us today. You may recall if you were here last year, Stephen was our keynote, and it was very early in his tenure here, and I've been thrilled to see the things that the EDP are doing, so thank you, Stephen, for joining us today. Um, Delegate Terry Kilgore and Delegate Israel O'Quinn are both with us today. If you could raise your hand, stand up and be recognized, that would be great. There's Terry back in the corner. Um, thank you both for your attention to Southwest Virginia um, and your dedication to, um, to supporting our work uh, in economic development. Uh, I'd also like to recognize, I'm a member of the Go Virginia Region 1 board. And I believe that we have nine or ten of the board members here with us today, and I think that demonstrates Go Virginia is really working to pull regions together for economic development, uh, and uh, I thank all of my fellow board members for joining us today. So, um, so in thinking about this region, uh, if you think about our landscapes um, and the landscapes that we have and what you find across the rest of the country, I think it's exciting and adventurous to see what we have in outdoor recreation. Um, we also have some of the most talented businesses and organizations, uh, and I must say some of the best institutions of higher education here in far southwest Virginia. But when I look at each of you, it reminds me why I love this place that I now call my home for these past five years. Um, it's the people who've made my time in Southwest Virginia so special and so rewarding. You welcomed my family and me nearly six years ago, and I've been chancellor since January of 2013, going into my sixth year. When my family and I moved to, move to Wise, Virginia from Fort Myers, Florida, my daughters were in middle school. Now high school seniors, I've witnessed them blossom and flourish with the dedicated teachers who coached, mentored, and mentored and advised them along the way. It's been an immense joy and honor to serve the College at Wise, and it's each of you who make this region so special. We all care about this place that we call home, and that pride is the source of boundless progress that we're working toward. Today's theme is talent, and I can think of no better area for us to explore and invest our time in today. I've spent my professional career helping individuals develop the knowledge, skills, and talents, and helping them to find ways to contribute to their families and their communities. Last week, we celebrated the graduation of nearly 300 UVA-Y students, and this summer, we prepare to welcome the future class of 2022. I ask you, what does the future have in store for them? 
Our work at these events is about these students and their talent. How do we plan for the future that this generation will face? We're so fortunate to have several college and high school students with us today, and I'm pleased to see them engaging in the future of our region. I'm also fascinated that those of you who might live to be centenarians may live to see the close of this century and celebrate the year 2100. That year is almost unfathomable, but between now and then, we will witness tremendous transformation in society, in law, in technology, social norms, and daily habits. Every aspect of life will be different, and we expect all of these students who will be here then to be on the cutting edge of those changes, and we expect them to be the agents of positive change. The current students who are entering college will be the inventors, the thinkers, and the leaders of both today and tomorrow. Our people are our greatest asset, and it's at the core of what UBA WISE is about. When I ask myself the question, why do we do what we do, it's all about the people. Even our community engagement and economic development work is focused on the lens of developing opportunities for our people. So we take a people first approach, a student first approach, and if the region is going to move forward, I believe that it's our investment in people which will lead the way. So it is my pleasure now to introduce our keynote speaker. Unfortunately, which is not typical for WISE, but the weather in Richmond prevented Governor Northam from making his way to far southwest Virginia. He sends his regrets. But the, secretary, the new Secretary of Commerce, Brian Ball, is here with us today, and he will be our keynote speaker and deliver remarks on behalf of the governor. And in a way of introduction, Brian Ball was appointed the Secretary of Commerce of Trade just in April of 2018. He previously served in the Northern Administration as Special Advisor for Economic Development and Deputy Secretary of Commerce and Trade. Prior to joining the Northern Administration, Brian was attorney at Williams Mullen, where he concentrated his practice in mergers and acquisitions, securities laws, and corporate governance matters. Brian served as trusted advisor to senior management, boards of directors and audit, and special board committees, <coughs> handling such matters as internal investigations and activist shareholders. He also regularly represents clients before state and federal administrative and Virginia General Assembly. He served on the firm's board of directors and was its general counsel. Mr. Ball graduated with high distinction from the University of Virginia, where he was an Echo Scholar and a member of Phi Beta Kappa. He received his Juris Doctor degree from the University of Virginia, and he was admitted to practice in Virginia, the District of Columbia, and California. He served as an assistant U.S. Attorney for Central District of California from 1981 to 1982. Brian and his wife Jennifer, formerly of Waynesboro, reside in Richmond, and they have two children. So please welcome to the stage a friend of Southwest Virginia, Brian Ball. Thank you, and um, I guess I'm sorry I'm not the governor, but I think it was fog in Richmond. I looked at this morning here, and um, when we have fog in Richmond, it's usually in the low part of the terrain, but when you look outside here, you have to look up because it's up in the mountains, because I said to somebody, it doesn't look too foggy here, and I said, look up there, that's where the airstrip is. So, um, so it's a little different here, but thank you so much for having us. Um, a bunch of us from the Secretary of some of the Commerce and Trade Secretariat have been here uh, since Monday, and we've seen so many places. It would take me quite a few minutes to go through all that, so I'm not going to do it, but uh, we've also had the EDP folks, uh, Department of Housing and Community Development folks with us, and everywhere we've gone, we've just gotten a wonderful, wonderful welcome, and it's just been a joy for us uh, to be here. And I know the governor wanted to be here. We were hoping to make this a two trips to the Southwest Virginia in one week. Um, God willing, we'll be, however, we'll be here tomorrow for an announcement, and so, uh, and we plan to be here uh, a lot uh, going forward. 
Um, just to talk a little bit about the governor, uh, and I, most of you know he's a uh, product or son of rural Virginia himself. He grew up on the eastern shore. The terrain's a little different there than it is here, I've, I've learned. And, um, uh, but, but some of the principles are the same. Um, uh, connection to land, uh, connection to home, you know your neighbors, uh, connection to family. And, um, uh, and like uh, uh, here, uh, the eastern shore, uh, has had its own challenges. Uh, economic engines there uh, have faltered, and um, children in that area, as well as uh, many rural jurisdictions, uh, areas of Virginia, as well as here, uh, have had to move away to find jobs to, to take care of their families. And that's in fact what the governor did. There, there was not the opportunity where he grew up to do what he wanted to do, so he, he left. And so the, 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 the common refrain is, uh, uh, we had a good life growing up, but there was not a lot for us to do here, so we, we moved on. And it's not, it, it's not a sufficient answer to say, well, you can move to a large city. That's just not, not the way we want to go uh, with this administration. Um, so the, the, the challenge for us all uh, is to figure out how to build up economic opportunities in, in rural Virginia. Uh, we have great uh, since the Great Recession, we've had uh, great strides as far as reducing unemployment in many parts of Virginia, but, but they persist even though there's been improvement. Uh, there's greater, uh, greater work to be done in, in Southwest Virginia and, and in rural Virginia generally. And there's also underemployment in these areas too, which, which is not, you can't sustain uh, on that basis. Um, so, uh, we're not unique in Virginia. I have learned, I'm, I'm new to the job, but I'm, I'm, I'm learning as fast as I can. Uh, but, but the loss of jobs in, across the country is, is, is a challenge for, for rural America. And, um, uh, and then you, you look at Southwest Virginia, and you've had some particular challenges, particularly with the, with the move away from, from coal. Uh, it, it's, it's created some very significant impacts to Coalfield communities in, in this area. So, uh, again, people have moved away, kids have moved away from job opportunities uh, elsewhere. And then the, the, the negative effect of that uh, is, is it affects schools, it, it affects uh, what your towns are able to do as far as provide services, it affects hospitals and, and fiscal pressure. And, and so we, we need to sort of stop that, turn that around, and go in a different direction. So, uh, as we look at as we look at Southwest Virginia uh, and in talking with the governor, we, our group talks every day about economic development. But it's uh, it's how do we create uh, economic opportunities uh, uh, in rural Virginia? And um, one thing I will say and, uh, from our visit here, and, and we're, this is our first stop uh, since I got the job. We're going to go all over the state, uh, uh, but we. Wanted to, we wanted to make a point, and that, that's why uh, our group uh, came here. But one thing we've noted, one thing we, we've learned, uh, and we've tried to be good, and good listeners, is you, you've got a, a uh, there are a lot of people pulling on the same board here. Uh, local governments, your General Assembly leadership is fantastic. State and federal partners, uh, the education uh, assets that you have here, the business community. And, and uh, all, all major players uh, committed to position in this area for, for growth. And uh, you've already made great strides uh, in that space. And, and I can't emphasize to you the importance of cooperation. I, I know there's a tendency to sort of want to divide and try to take care of this area or that area, but uh, you get a whole lot farther when you, you pull on the same board. And, and I have been in, I've been in this job long enough and I've seen from my prior life in, private practice, there are regions of the state, and they're, they're all, I want to say, uh, well to the east of, of you, I won't specify any of them by name, uh, but where, where cooperation is, 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 is not, is not the, the mainstay of the effort, it's, it, there's divisive efforts, and, and you, you just don't sell well when you're, when, you're not, when you're not working together. So you all have realized that, and, um, and, 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 and as a result, you're making, I think, some great strides uh, forward. Um, 
We've seen some things on our trip. Uh, we went to, uh, uh, we spent time on the Crooked Road and Hardwood. And you've got Appalachian Springs and around the Mountain Artisan Trail, which we didn't see. So you've got some very unique music and art traditions that you're, you're building on. And um, uh, one thing you've got that, that I think is unparalleled on the East Coast is just this natural beauty of these, these natural assets. And I, I pray you never compromise those because that, uh, particularly younger people, whose quality of life is, is hugely important to them where they, get, where they make decisions about where they're going to live. And um, you've got some wonderful things to talk about. I, I, uh, you got the Clinch River Valley Initiative, uh, ATV trails, bike, bike, bike uh, horse trails, that sort of thing. Um, you also have, I, I, I will be back until I've accomplished this life goal, but you've got elk around here. And uh, it's my goal, I will come back here until I can see some elk. I have a very good friend, Leon Boyd, who's on the, serve, on, he serves on the board of the Department of Gaming and Fisheries, which until recently I served on. He's been the father of, of, of bringing elk to, to Virginia. And people are, they're paying money to come down here and see, and see elk. So, uh, Treasure and cherish these assets. They're wonderful attractants for, for people who, who want a happy and a different lifestyle with a strong emphasis on quality of life. Uh, Delegate Kilgore was um, telling me about St. Paul, which we didn't get to this trip, but we will get to the next trip. And I understand there's uh, two hotels coming online there, uh, and, um, uh, and and there's a lot of excitement there, which is, and, and we, we talk, took a walking tour in Bristol. We did with Phil, I'm sure I've left out some of the places we've been, but, but there's a lot of excitement about uh, smaller town Virginia and finding ways to to reinvent uh, uh, reinvent these communities. They'll, they'll become tourist destinations, but when you create quality of life, they also become attractants to, to businesses, large, large and small, and, and uh, that is. Uh, that's what you know, we're seeing that in other places uh, around the country. We're seeing it in other places, even in Virginia. Uh, and so that's that's you're going in the right direction here. Um, and you're looking at it from a game regional perspective. I mean, I can say three words: cooperation, cooperation, cooperation. If, if one community here is successful, every community here is successful. So I can't emphasize that strongly enough. Um, the uh, Again, so just to sort of summarize what I what we've seen that you've done as we've, we've been going around and listening is it's you, you've, you've done you've got a regional brand here, uh, you've got a community cooperative uh, building efforts, you've got entrepreneurial approaches, uh, you're doing targeted business attraction and, and and doing working on retention and development of 21st century uh, workforce competencies. Um, you're going to need all of these things. There's no, uh, there's no silver bullet. Uh, uh, the coal industry, when it was, when it was in its heyday, was a monolithic industry. It took care of an awful lot of people. Uh, but I think uh, you all know better than, than anyone because you're here that, that, that uh, there's not likely to be one silver bullet that comes along to, to fix this, so uh, to, to get you where you want to go. So it's going to take uh, lots of effort. It's going to take small and medium-sized businesses investments that uh, in that space and, and efforts there. So I, I like to think of it in terms of singles and doubles. And, and uh, uh, if you're hitting singles and doubles, you, you're doing just fine because uh, that's how you score runs. Um, the governor is uh, wants to uh, share some of the commitments that, that he is making and that he wants our administration to make during the time he will be, be with us. And um, first, I'd say first and foremost is um, We've learned, and I in particular have I've learned because I didn't really know this until I got into this job. Others are like years ahead of me, but um, a well-trained workforce is one of the most important factors in, in attracting businesses and how close they are to where the business may locate uh, it is, is, important, um, uh, is important too. And um, we know in Virginia we have some very good, uh, we feel very proud of our K, K through uh, 12 uh, and our higher education institutions, we're proud of those. But I don't believe we're considered a leader yet in state workforce development uh, programs, and, and, and that's that's about to change. And uh, if you haven't heard the name Megan Healy, you, you, you need to start looking for that name Megan Healy because uh, she's we have a cabinet level position. She's chief workforce 
advisor, but she comes out of the Indian college system. She knows this education deal, and, and, and we're talking constantly, constantly about um, talking to employers, finding out what they need, whether it's degrees, whether it's certifications, that sort of thing, and, and, and then going and creating those programs to, to uh, instead of just a historical fixed kind of curriculum, it's, it's coming up with programs that, that take kids coming out of high school and, and get them ready so that when they get out of school or the certification programs, they're, uh, they're ready to go. And, um, uh, so our goal is to have a, a to, to create a, a world-class custom uh, workforce uh, uh, program. And uh, beginning in July, in partnership with VEDP and the community college system will be doing just that. And our goal, uh, the governor's goal, is we want this to be one of the top five programs by the time he completes his term. Uh, we also know that uh, we need to be, and this, when I say we, at this one, the state, we, we, you've got some great sites down here for, for, for corporate development, but we need to be marketing rural Virginia and the region uh, so America uh, and, and, and the world can see uh, the great assets that we have here. And uh, just so you mentioned uh, Stephen Murray a little while ago, uh, he, he's been talking to me about marketing since the, the day I first shook his hand and uh, when I got the job. And, um, just to put that in, a, in, a term, in terms, because I keep asking, what do you mean by marketing? What do you mean by marketing? Marketing is a, is a fuzzy thing. Uh, uh, and, but when uh, site consultants get calls from corporations about doing expansions or relocations, uh, or relocations, I should say, they often have five states that they have in mind, and they say, go find us sites in these five states. And Virginia is in one of those states. And we, we've got, it should, it should be one of those states. So we've got to get a story out so that when the site consultant gets that call and that corporate uh, executive says, go find us a location in one of these five states, Virginia's one of those five states, because then you're in the game, then you can start talking, and then you can start showing off what you got here. So uh, that is a goal. Uh, we're going to invest uh, very heavily in, in Wonderful crown jewel you got sitting here. I'm speaking before you today, which is UVA uh, Wise. So let's give UVA Wise a big hand. <laughs> That's the mainstay of, of this community, and you're, it's, uh, you're, you're developing programs or you have programs in, in cybersecurity, and energy, and computer science, and unmanned uh, aerial systems, which is going to be a big deal. Um, Another area where the government, the governor has made uh, a commitment is to expand broadband access. We, 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 that's the beginning and the end. You can't, you can't get there from here. If, uh, not only places where people work have broadband access, but you can't get people who want to very much move to an area if they can't get broadband access in their homes. So uh, we know we need to, uh, we know we need to work very hard on that. And so the governor is very committed to expanding broadband access in Southwest Virginia. Um, if you've been under a rock, you might not know this, but you, you'll know uh, most of the, I'm sure all of you know, our governor is a, is a pediatric neurologist by, by training, um, and he knows uh, as well as anybody's going to be able to know that uh, being healthy is the best way to, um, for someone to be able to contribute um, to work, to, to be a productive person in the workforce, and so no secret, uh, he's been supportive of Medicaid expansion uh, and, and uh, recognizes uh, what it will mean uh, for this region. You've got lots of folks that would be eligible for Medicaid expansion if, uh, if, if we expand it. And um, you've got states right next door that have done expansion, Kentucky and West Virginia. So you're competing against these states with just one hand behind your back. And I, I uh, uh, you know, I'm not going to try to put the politics into this. I'll, I don't really think that way, but why would you collect money in Virginia and send it into Washington and have it go somewhere else? And my thought is, it's your money, we might as well take it and spend it on, we might as well take it and spend it on our own needs. And we have plenty of uh, needs for medical care here and, and in other parts of Virginia, and particularly in the rural areas. And I know he's 100% committed to getting that done. Um, the other thing uh, I would say to you, um, and it's just, this has been the joy of working with this governor because 
he wakes up and thinks about Virginia. He's such a decent person. He just believes in Virginia to his core, and and he's he's able to work with everybody. And uh, you've got wonderful, uh, a wonderful legislative leadership here. You've got Terry Kilmore, who, uh, who's who's helped in the vacate expansion space. Also put me on to the new hotel that was going up in St. Paul, so we are going to go there when we come back. You've got Todd Pillion. Uh, you've got Will Moorefield, who partnered up with Lacherie's Air, and has come up with a, an interesting statute that uh, will, will create, we hope, some incentives to, to attract business. You've got Israel Quinn, you've got, you've got Ben Chafin, and, and um, it, it's, it's, I'll mention to you, everything that I just gave you is, is a Republican, is an R, and, and the governor and our administration is obviously the Democratic administration. It doesn't make a bit of difference. This is, this is something we're all in together. And party, in, in our judgment, is, is relevant to that. Uh, we're all pulling the same order to try to get this done. Um, so. and, 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 and thank you for that. And, let, and let's just think about why we're doing it. Let's think about what the end game is when, when we talk about this. Um, it, it's, it's not for the party to score political points. It's to create opportunities so other young people can stay home and find satisfying. Uh, and good lives uh, in their home region and build good lives for themselves and for their families. It's, it's that simple. And, um, uh, and, and it's up to us, uh, you all have done so many good things, and it's up to us to scale the commitment that the state makes to, 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 to be adequate, to, to confront and, and overcome the challenges we face today. So I tell, I tell you today, I mean, we can't guarantee outcomes. Uh, we, we can't do that. We don't, you know, that nobody can read the future what's going to go on with the economy or you know, what's going on in the world uh, stage, the world stage, what's going on out there. But we can, we can tell you we're going to work hard and we're going to be here a lot. I know the governor's planning to be here a lot. Uh, our Commerce and Trade will be here a lot. You'll see, I, you'll see, you'll see Cassidy Bassman, our deputy. Uh, you'll see others from our department. Uh, and I want you to know all of us share uh, this, uh, this commitment to, to, to doing good things in, in Southwest Virginia. And, and uh, again, thank you. The hospitality here has been fantastic, and, and we look forward to being back here with you again real soon. Thank you.
their plan for universal connectivity throughout the Commonwealth. Significant research, analysts, and expertise went into crafting this roadmap, and uh, Sunset was proud to be a part of that and proud to, to uh, lead that charge here in Southwest Virginia. Yeah, today's forum is about talent. Uh, talent is, is deep and wide in Southwest. The skill sets are broad, but so is the geography. Sunset's poised to connect, to wire the workforce, to equip the talent with the tools that it needs to, with fiber to the home, to engage in a worldwide uh, competition in the new Virginia economy on a level playing field. That's our commitment to you. We'd like to thank, I'd like to thank our partners in this, the Jim Baldwin and his board and team at the Plateau, Plateau, uh, Dwayne Miller and his team and board at Winnewisco, and both of those groups' efforts uh, as they formulate the Virginia, formulate the Virginia Coalfield Coalition. Uh, those folks, along with uh, our Southwest delegation, Virginia Tobacco Commission, and untold uh, folks in state, local, and federal government have gotten us here. And I can promise you the dividends are going to be high uh, once the workforce is connected. And all those points that the Secretary made are, are, are pertinent and, and, and valid and but they need connection, they need broadband. And it's the most important piece of infrastructure in my lifetime. Uh, and, and we're here to provide it for you. But I'm here to introduce your next speaker. Uh, Dr. Keith Perry will give you the State of the Region report. Uh, Dr. Perry has spent 22 years in the Virginia public school system. Started in the Washington County uh, uh, system in the classroom and then spent nine years in administration as a Patrick Henry High School principal. Uh, was then selected as the superintendent of schools in the city of Norton, Virginia, and most recently, in January of 2017, was selected to be superintendent of schools in Bristol City Public Schools. Uh, my, my kids don't attend Bristol City Schools, but I follow Dr. Perrigan on, on social media and I'm continually impressed with his uh, critical thinking and the way he applies innovative approaches to, to the critical problems that face our school system. Uh, the way he engages his staff and his teachers and his children uh, opens new doors for them on a regular basis. The most important thing that I found in research and in my introduction is that Dr. Pearson is the blueprint for our young talent in this region. He was born and raised in Washington County and attended John Battle High School went to Virginia Islands Community College and uh, finished his bachelor's degree here at the University of Virginia Applies. Took advantage of our regional resources at, existing at Radford University for his uh, master's degree and got his uh, doctorate at Virginia Tech. And a lot of people do those things. But what he chose to do was come back to our region, give back to this community, be a leader, be a teacher, and that's an example, that's the blueprint that our kids and they say, well, there's nothing, I can't, I can't do anything here. You tell me, look up at Bristol Super on, your, on Twitter. Uh, turn on WCYB and look at Dr. Barrett. You can be somebody here. You can be somebody in the board. And you can give back. And I'd like to introduce Dr. Keith Barrett. So thank you, Mr. Puckett, for that very nice introduction. Um, I, also, I don't know what, how I threw the short straw and had to speak after the secretary. Um, but I will, I'll try to do my best to make sure that you are informed about the state of the region. I was told that I had 10 minutes to speak, and Carl just informed me that I have nine. And those of you who know me know that's going to be a challenge. So I'm going to speak very quickly, and uh, if, if I speak too quickly over a subject, you can catch me afterwards, and, I, and I'll tell you what it was I was trying to say. Um, but as Mr. <coughs> Puckett said, I am the superintendent of Bristol Virginia Public Schools, and uh, most of uh, before there, I was over here in Norton, and one of the things that the Secretary spoke about was cooperation and coalitions. And superintendents in the Coalfield region a couple years ago, we saw a huge decline in our enrollment. And as a result of that, actually this was kind of like maybe a, the brainchild or an offshoot of the original economic forum. Superintendents over here got together and said, we've got to have a stronger voice with budgetary and legislative issues in Richmond. So we started the Coalfield Coalition. As a result of that, 
and our conversations about the mobile laws in our area, we were able to, to work with legislators, our Southwest Coalition, our Southwest Delegation, to get $7 million in enrollment loss uh, added back to the Virginia State budget. And because of that success, we've expanded. We now have this small and rural schools coalition, which includes 71 school divisions across the Commonwealth. And so we're working to, uh, on behalf of all small and rural school divisions, and it was an offshoot of the economic board. Very quickly about Bristol, we have about 2,200 students. Our population is 17,000. In Southwest Virginia, we're an average high school system. Across the Commonwealth, you know, we're very small. <clears throat> Over 75% of our students receive free or reduced price lunches. That's very different from the Bristol I grew up in 30 years ago. Um, the face of Bristol and Southwest Virginia has changed over the last few decades. Five of our six schools in Bristol are uh, qualified for the community eligibility provision, which means every student in those schools get free uh, lunch and breakfast. A couple of our schools, we actually serve free dinner too. Despite that, uh, those challenges we have with poverty, we anticipate that all of our schools will be fully accredited next year. Also, uh, our school board has recently voted to consolidate our four aging elementary schools. Two of those were built during the uh, FDR's administration and the other was built in the Truman administration. So it's about time and uh, we're going to combine into one primary and one intermediate school. Uh, we're also very proud of our partnership with Electromechanical Corporation <clears throat> where uh, we met with them about a year ago and they told us that they had a very specific need for skilled workers who had a certain credential when they left high school. So we're working with our manufacturing teacher at Virginia High School to make sure the students learn those skills, take the test for that credential, so that when they graduate from Virginia High, they can step right out of our halls and into the, uh, the buildings of electromechanical um, and, and have jobs. We also are looking forward to a regional partnership with United Way. A new graduation requirement is that all students must graduate with an internship experience. Uh, public schools, we don't have the capacity to develop those internship opportunities. So we're going to work with United Way to have a regional internship coordinator, and I'm sure that you're already, many of you in this room are already working with United Way to get those internships set up. So we're really excited about that. And then finally, I hope the secretary is still here. If, in case you're a business and you're looking to relocate, Bristol has opportunities. We have a huge space at the Bristol Mall, over 600,000 square feet, and also at Alpha Natural Resources, the old building there, we have 130,000 uh, square feet of Class A space. So Mr. Secretary, as you're recruit, recruiting, keep Southwest Virginia, and especially Bristol in mind. Thank you. <clears throat> so, talking about the region as a whole, um, your unemployment is a little more than the state average at about 5.1%. We have lows and highs. Scott County is a little better. Uh, Buchanan County doesn't fare as well. Um, <clears throat> from a poverty standpoint, about 20% of our families live in poverty. And that's a family of four who lives on $36,000 a year or less. And our annual household income in Southwest Virginia is $36,000, which is well below the Virginia average of 65,000. So it's easy to see economically we have some challenges here in Southwest Virginia. That is a very fast clicker. Okay, from a health and wellness standpoint, um, uh, when you look at adult obesity, we're, we're hovering around the, the state average of 28%, which, which is not a good thing anyway, but some of our communities even exceed that and go as high as 35%. As far as drug-related deaths, as everyone's aware, unless you're living under a rock, you're aware of the opioid crisis. It has a huge impact here in Southwest Virginia. In some of our counties, we're seeing 40 drug-related deaths per 100,000 residents. And that is well above the average in Virginia at 14. And thankful for Delegate Todd Gillian and his leadership in this area trying to, to work to correct this problem. As far as uh, smokers go, we, uh, some of our counties are in the state average of 15%. However, we also have some counties that are well above that at 22%. So we do have some health and wellness issues here in Southwest Virginia. At education and workforce, we currently have 84% of our residents have a high school diploma. Again, that's below the state average. Uh, only 11% of our residents have a bachelor's degree or higher compared to 22% statewide, and even lower than that with an advanced degree as a, a graduate or professional degree at only 5.5%, well below the average of 15.8% in Virginia. However, we also have a lot of talent, we have a lot of opportunities, and we have a lot of opportunities for future success. 
K-12 has to help with some of those issues that we just talked about. K-12 has to be an economic partner for each and every person in this room, each and every business in this room, and for our region as a whole. Southwest Virginia, you may not know this, our graduation rate currently, even though our current residents are behind the state average, Southwest Virginia's graduation rates exceed the state and the national average for graduation. And when our students graduate, I'll take, I'll take partial credit for this. Uh, but not only are they graduating, but when they graduate, they're graduating work ready. Um, last year, over 5,000 workforce ready credentials or certificates were awarded to graduates right here in Southwest Virginia. So when they, we're not just getting them through, we're getting them through and they're work ready. <clears throat> Ten school divisions in Southwest Virginia out of 17 have an in-house cybersecurity program. If you haven't heard the governor or the previous governor talk about the abundance of cybersecurity jobs across the Commonwealth that are in the field, uh, you're not listening. And uh, so we decided that we needed to be part of that solution. We want to bring those jobs here in Southwest Virginia, so we're teaching those courses in our classrooms. And for those divisions who don't teach it in-house, they have opportunities through our regional governor school to teach cybersecurity. <clears throat> Southwest Virginia leads the state, you may not be aware of this, in math and science standardized test scores. We exceed every other, other region of the state, including Northern Virginia, in math and science uh, standardized test scores, and that is no small task. Ridgeview High School has a world-class robotics team right here in our neighboring Dickinson County. They went to Detroit and, and competed on, a, on an international stage and placed ninth. And not only on the technology side of the curriculum, but also on the art side of the curriculum, Central, Wise Central and Eastside High School are state champions in one-act play. Uh, so Eastside has done that three times in a row, and Wise Central has done it twice. As far as points of pride, we've got a lot of other good things going on outside of K-12, and, and Carl is getting ready to throw something at me, I can see, but I'm talking fast. <laughs> Lincoln Memorial uh, has one of only 30 veterinary colleges uh, in the country, which is in neighboring Kentucky, but <coughs> excuse me, they have a satellite site in Lee County. Uh, MC Signs is able to build national contracts. They uh, have contracts with Hilton and AMC. Wolf Hill Fabricators in Abington recently built floodgates for New York City at a $64 million, that was a $64 million project. Each of those gates weighed 25 tons, made right in Abington. And then Jayco Manufacturing, not only do they provide one of only five companies to make fire, fire resistant caulk, they're the only company in the nation that makes fire proof caulk. And Strongwell in Bristol uh, has actually developed a, a ballistic resistant uh, material that can be used in construction. We're actually working with them currently to try to, uh, we're doing a renovation at one of our schools to install that fiberglass like sheetrock that's ballistic in, in our classrooms to make sure that our students are safe. All those things are happening right here in Southwest Virginia. So, so what does that mean? We talked about a lot of challenges that we have in Southwest Virginia, but we also have a lot of opportunities. And our challenge today as regional leaders is to find ways to communicate, collaborate, and cooperate together to make sure that we leverage those assets, those talents, and those opportunities to make sure that Southwest Virginia has a vibrant economy that's co competitive at the Commonwealth level, but also on a national stage. Thank you very much. Have a great day. John Rock, Senior Vice President for the Southwest Virginia Region for First Bank and Trust Company and also direct the SBA lending and USDA DNI. Allow me to tell you a little bit about First Bank and Trust Company. First Bank and Trust Company with an asset size of $1.7 billion focuses on building communities through its competitive lending and exceptional deposit products. The bank grows because the senior management and board of directors focus on finding the right people. And I was fortunate enough to have Justin Trent, a graduate of UVA Wise, join our management training program 18 months ago, and now he's a loan officer for our bank and portfolio manager. So I'm real happy about that. We also have the talent here in Wise County with Jonathan Mullins, uh, Melissa Coffey, uh, Vicki Dodson, Samantha Stanley, and their, their staff. First Bank and Trust Company also has 307 employees across Virginia and East Tennessee with 189 employees right here in all of Southwest Virginia from Bristol to Wise to Whitfield. And I want to share with you some of the highlights of what we did together in 2009.
2017. We helped 909 families refinance or buy new homes for a total of $144.6 million. We helped 519 family farmers in their endeavors to supply food for our country and extend it. And we also extended 998 commercial loans for a total of $312 million to assist business owners in starting, growing, or expanding their business, fostering American entrepreneurialism. And we assisted 1,109 individual consumers with $9.6 million in new loans. And what's most important to me is that we raised the minimum wage of all employees to no less than $15 an hour. And we were one of the first companies in the United States to do that. And that resulted in a powerful message to our employees of their importance to our organization. We also focus on SBA loans to help small businesses in our communities grow. And we also partnered with USDA and FSA on agriculture lending. But I'm here for another reason, too. I'm here to introduce our next moderator for the Beyond Borders panel, John Smolak. Let me tell you a little bit about John. John is the Director of Economic and Business Development for Appalachian Power, a unit of American electrical power. And John has spent the last 40 years in various capacities in both the private and public sector with economic development, most notably previously serving, serving as President and CEO of Franklin Southampton Economic Development Incorporated in Virginia, and also serving as Chairman and Board Member of Senator Jay Rockefeller's Discover the Real West Virginia Foundation. And that's a private sector organization dedicated to creating new economic business growth in West Virginia. He was also chairman of the Southern Economic Development Council and 17 state regional development association and served on their executive board of directors for six years. Joining John on the panel is Brad Hall. Brad is vice president of external affairs for the Appalachian Power of Eastern Kentucky. Michael Griffith, Executive Vice President with Security Federal Savings Bank, located in McMinnville, Tennessee, and he's rocking some really cool looking socks this morning. And Jack Meadows, Director of Planning and Community Development in Salar City, North Carolina. And Judy Topp is a Community Development Project Coordinator for West Virginia Community Development Hub. Uh, please join me in welcoming these panel guests. Good morning, thank you very much. Um, I'm John Smolak with Appalachian Power Company, and um, it's really great to be um, <clears throat> here for the third, third session of the forum, and we're very pleased and honored to be a sponsor of today's event. And <clears throat> I want to take just a couple minutes to just say thanks to Chancellor Henry, Shannon Blevins, and Becky O'Quinn uh, for doing a great job with the planning committee wonderful, wonderful uh, event that we've got in mind for you today. Um, a little bit about us, why we're here, why, why is Appalachian AP here to, to uh, help sponsor this? Well, it's all about the economic and business development. Uh, we are involved with our communities. We want to see the area grow. Uh, we want to be a part of that, and we always have been a part of that, but we want to make sure that going forward, that uh, we do everything we can to help help the region, and and this kind of ties into our panel today a little bit about some of the good things that are happening in different parts of, of the states that surround Virginia. So we've got some community leaders. We have Brad Hall with our company, who was in uh, Eastern Kentucky prior to coming with Appalachian Power Company. So what I'm going to do is uh, we're going to go in the order of Michael Griffith first, and they're going to kind of give just a brief self-bio of themselves as they uh, begin to talk about their community. And then we'll go from Michael to Jack to Brad and Jenny. And um, they've got some good stories to tell. And Beyond Borders is to learn um, other success stories uh, of other areas of states that have gone through transitional times difficult economic times and what they've done to try to bring uh, the economy up, put their people back to work, and uh, get the economy going again. So I'll start with Michael. Well, thank you very much, uh, 
And I want to echo the, uh, the accolades uh, for the university and everybody that's involved in putting this program. Uh, as a Tennessee native, and uh, you know, thanks for uh, uh, John for recognizing my Tennessee socks. So uh, I take a lot of pride in being a Tennessean, and I'm, I'm thankful for being up here today. But uh, I come from McMinnville, Tennessee. My family's been there for over 200 years, and uh, I'm very blessed to uh, make a living as a banker in my community. Uh, one of the things about being a banker in a community is sometimes you, you've got everybody's brother-in-law to bank, and then sometimes you have, uh, you know, newcomers. So it's a, it's quite the uh, the challenge every day. But uh, we've been blessed. Um, small bank, and if you think of McMinnville, Tennessee, if you know where Nashville is and Chattanooga is, we're right in between on the plateau. So the the terrain is very similar here. It's a beautiful part of Virginia, and it's home to me. Elevation's a little bit higher, but I'm used to. Uh, the hills and the valleys and everything and just uh, feel very much at home here. Um, what we do at Security Federal is we're primarily a community bank and we uh, try to develop our hometown. Uh, a lot of us that live and work there um, didn't really get frustrated with seeing the opportunity to revitalize our downtown and bring the things that we wanted that all the other communities that we got to travel in the southeast had and that way we didn't have to travel so far and we were blessed to have an entrepreneurial class that's really developed and uh, I convinced my board of directors for us to make a clear and conscious effort to cultivate that. And so we've tried to uh, look at that. So some of these slides that you'll see, uh, what I'm proud most specifically, like you guys are, is our rivers locally. Uh, we've got over 150 miles of rivers that uh, range in class one to class five rapids. Uh, we're also in neighboring White County, is home of Jackson Kayak, which is the largest kayak manufacturer in the world. And we're very proud of them. Yeah, and another uh, big part of tourism that we just had a huge opportunity, and if some of you have seen this on public broadcasting, it's called uh, formerly Bluegrass Underground, now it's Cumberland Caverns Live. And uh, Cumberland Caverns is one of the largest uh, caves in the United States, over 50,000 visitors a year. And uh, another big draw that we didn't realize that was in our waters, uh, Southern Muskie, uh, Tennessee Wildlife Re uh, Resources uh, Association basically uh, helped us out a great deal in finding out that the muskies were native to the area. Uh, just last weekend we attended the uh, Hardly Strictly Muskie Tournament, which is phenomenal. Uh, the furthest group was uh, Bozeman, Montana, excuse me, Missoula, Montana, drove all the way down to fish for our southern muskie, and we found out that that's been a, a huge draw. As you can see, regular paddle sports, as I've noticed in the exhibit uh, hall today, and then also in this community on the clinch, which uh, I'm looking forward to being a part of this weekend sometime. Uh, it's very popular. Another group is the Isha Foundation that located on uh, several hundred acres on our Cumberland Plateau to have a yoga and wellness institute. Um, like everybody else, uh, we are very uh, proud of our visitor numbers that we actually have. Um, and we've really tried to focus on the fact of quality of life. We realize, as you can see here, where McMimble is in the center of that map, the proximity to Nashville and Chattanooga, that, you know, there's a lot of industrial recruiters in this group, but you can see we couldn't always write the biggest check, but we could provide a great place for people to live and if they could work close by. And we found out that they didn't like sitting in traffic every day. Um, our real estate was a lot cheaper. If we could just have the amenities, that would, that would actually drawn into our area. Uh, we continue, like every community, I'm sure, to focus on second homeowners, retirees, uh, but the new focus is, is basically we suffered from a brain drain. Uh, when I graduated high school 25 years ago, everybody left. I stayed and went to a, a, a four-year university similar to Wise that was close on our Cumberland Plateau, and you can see that uh, we wanted to make sure that we had that brain drain in reverse, so we brought the talent that, that live here. They may work somewhere else, but you know, they're paying property taxes, and that's what we like. So just as I wrap up, this is our new uh, logo. We were blessed to get a grant uh, through the state of Tennessee. Uh, and I want to echo the governor's uh, remarks and the secretary's remarks about investing in, uh, in rural broadband, and that's huge. Uh, we were fortunate enough to get this uh, very creative marketing team to come in and give us a new logo. Uh, they're going to put that logo strategically in Nashville do a social media campaign where if you take your picture with our logo that's located throughout Nashville, you can get an all-expenses paid trip to McMinnville. So it was kind of innovative to do something different. Um, this is a uh, 
kind of a reference to our past and our history with this logo. So we're very proud of it. And there's our dome downtown. So I'll conclude with my remarks. Hey, thank you, Michael, very much. Um, what we're going to do is uh, we also have another breakout session after the main session we have right now. So if we have time, we'll, we'll have some questions. We'll entertain some from the audience as well as I've got some questions here as well. But um, we'll continue on with the panel. And please also make sure you uh, maybe come to our breakout session um, after, after the break. Uh, we'll go to um, Jack Meadows right now. Thank you. Um, I'll start off by saying <clears throat> I'm from uh, North Carolina. I was uh, uh, born and raised in eastern North Carolina. We have three sort of regions in North Carolina, Piedmont, eastern, and, and western North Carolina. I uh, went to school at UNC at Wilmington and uh, graduate school in East Carolina. I've been uh, the planning director with the town of Silo City uh, for about 15 years now, and uh, my title was director of planning and community development. And that, uh, I want to preface that by saying uh, that's probably interesting for me to be up here. There's a lot of planning directors that probably aren't as involved in economic development as I am as my position, but the, the board and, and manager has uh, gave me that opportunity to be a part of the economic development board. About half my work is related to community and economic development, but the other half is uh, as a zoning administrator and, and through doing plans and, and permits. Um, I met my wife, we've got three kids uh, in Silver City. Uh, it was my first time moving from Eastern North Carolina. I went to school, raised all in Eastern North Carolina, and then moved to Piedmont. Silver City is about uh, an hour west of, of Raleigh, North Carolina, our capital. Um, it's not very far from the Triad of the Greensboro, Winston Salem uh, area as well. Uh, but that gives you a little bit of background about me and, and where I come from. Um, Chatham, uh, Silas is located in Chatham County. It uh, joins Wake County, which is where Raleigh is. Um, there's a lot of wealth that comes out of the uh, Triangle area, and it's um, uh, vastly, quickly moving into Chatham. Chatham is the one of the wealthiest counties in, in North Carolina, um, and that is an interesting uh, dynamic we find in our county, because Silas City is uh, one of the poor communities in the, in the state, so it's uh, uh, town that's sort of lost in its county. Uh, just to give you a few uh, demographics, the um, uh, per capita income in Silo City is about 14,000. Uh, medium family income is about 35,000. Average age is 35. Um, Silo City was uh, set on the 1750s by the Silo family. Uh, they're from Germany. And uh, in 1887, it was incorporated once the railroad run, uh, ran through uh, the community. It's Norfolk Southern Railroad. There's no stops by Norfolk Southern in Silo City, but it moves traffic between Sanford and Greensboro. Um, small town economy based on textiles, uh, furniture, poultry processing, uh, made that community ha have, have a lot of success through the uh, 50s and 60s. And then coming to the 1980s uh, and through 2010, I would say we lost all that. Uh, economic base, furniture, textiles, and even our poultry processing. Uh, so that's um, when we got a little more active and got more involved in uh, economic development and, and, and my position doing uh, various things. And I'd say one of the key things that uh, that happened was we, we created a partnership with the North Carolina Rural Center and uh, that really opened some doors from South, for Silo City, my, myself, and the things that I do and the town as a whole. Uh, Silo City, Approximately 9,000 people, just under 9,000 folks. Um, population made up of 50% Hispanic. There's about 15,000 residents that live within a uh, five mile radius. So it gives you a little bit of an idea about the town. Um, also, uh, we're known for Aunt B. Aunt B, uh, from the Andy Griffith Show, she, uh, she moved to Silo City after she uh, retired from uh, uh, movies in, in Hollywood. And, uh, and her, her resting place is in Silo City in our town cemetery. Uh, a couple other things we're known for is uh, Brookwood Farms is a, a large uh, uh, package producer of uh, barbecue. They cook the barbecue and sell it in wholesale. Uh, I think today they're in most any state um, uh, of the 
my own mistakes this year, following my own mistakes. Uh, I was in Snowshoe Mountain a few years ago, and they were selling barbecue in the restaurant uh, with their barbecue sandwiches. Um, another uh, neat, uh, unique thing about Silo City is the North Carolina Arts Incubator. It's, uh, it was an opportunity to uh, bring artists in, in one space to uh, incubate, uh, rent space uh, cheaply, work with each other, use some of the uh, equipment, materials, and that's been successful in redevelopment downtown. Um, a couple of things that uh, I'd like to share is uh, partnerships have been, as I said, the World Center, but the partnerships have developed from uh, DOT to uh, our NCDOT, uh, the health department, the schools. Uh, we, we've just tried to uh, turn over every stone that's available to us and, and, and move through with those projects. And they are projects like something that Michael mentioned, uh, branding and logos, doing strategic plans, uh, pedestrian plans, uh, downtown master plan, facade grants, and uh, the, a lot of that initial work that we did through the Rural Center is, is turned into lots of grants. Uh, right now the manager is, he just was announced as the top 40 of 40 in, in the triangle. And uh, one of the things in his report was that we're, we're working on $34 million in grants in our little community at, at this time. And those grants are roads, sidewalks, uh, water and sewer lines, wastewater treatment upgrades, water plant upgrades, uh, aviation improvements. We've got a solid city municipal airport. Just recently EPA announced that we were a uh, awardee of the $300,000 community, uh, community assessment grant. Um, we've applied for that for a few years. That was because of a partnership with uh, a couple of companies. Uh, we're going to re renovate our swimming pool. It's going to be a multi-use lap pool with uh, a zero entry for, for everybody. You know, the public can provide access for, for those that can't swim or uh, maybe handicapped. Um, one other thing I want to mention is that uh, we, we found some success in it. I think it's uh, one thing I'm highly involved in is uh, we have, we have uh, development ordinances. And uh, for a long time, our development ordinances were, I would say, uh, what, we, what we say sometimes, they're written in stone, they were unchanging. And uh, our board today is, is welcoming the idea of change. And that's been very successful in, in helping businesses and, and others. Uh, reinvest in our community because sometimes the cost of reinvestment or development was pretty expensive so we reduced those requirements obviously had on some value of safety and so forth but um, I'll end I think I'll end there yeah. Brad? Well, good morning uh, my name is Brad Hall and, and I'm from uh, just across the mountain in a little place called Wilright, Kentucky in southern Floyd County. spent most of my life in the Pikeville area and uh, all my mother's family is from a place called Beefide over in Dorton. So uh, I can pretty much still rock at this area and uh, we spent a lot of time uh, throughout this area throughout my life. Uh, so uh, eastern Kentucky and this part of the world is, has always been very important to me. Um, but just to give you a little background about my passion in economic development is I grew up in Wheelwright, which at the time was probably the gem of eastern Kentucky. The city was built by Inland Steel. Um, they put in an Olympic-sized swimming pool, a golf course, everything. We had everything. The company built it. And as I grew up, I watched that community die. Uh, as the coal was gone, so was the industry. And we can tell that story over and over and over again throughout our territories. In Eastern Kentucky, we lost 12,500 coal jobs in a very short period of time, and I know that this area lost many as well. Those folks make $80,000 a year with great benefits. How do you replace that in your community? And it takes time. Because we talk about economic development, and I always get criticized because I don't focus on tourism, I don't focus on retail, I focus on industrial development. Um, coal was very important because it, it created a product that we sold outside our borders and brought new money into the economy. For a community to be really successful in economic development, you have to do that. You have to find a way to bring new money in. You can't just keep recirculating the same dollar in your community. You've got to find a way to bring in new money. 
So what I'm going to talk to you about today, it took us about eight to ten years to get to the success that we're now seeing in Eastern Kentucky. Uh, now, as of about three weeks ago, I'm a Virginian. I uh, just uh, took a job with Appalachian Power, so John and I will be working together uh, very closely on economic development and other things. Um, so we're, we're very excited about what we can do here. And John's already been doing some very good things, as many of you know, and we're going to try to provide him with some more resources and our communities with some more resources to do even more. So I went to college at University of Pikeville, and um, I've just spent almost all my life in that part of the world. And about 14 months ago, I moved to Ashland uh, on this journey, and now I ended up in Roanoke. Um, but the journey was to find a way to create opportunities for Central Appalachia in this part of the world. So I could spend probably four hours on each of these topics. Because what I want to talk about uh, today, I'll get to our successes, but I want you to understand, and many of you probably know, what it takes to get there. But the good news is, is that you have the assets to do it. It's a matter of working together to accomplish it. So we spend a lot of time on site preparedness. I'll talk to you a little bit about that. And you're kind of ahead of the game in many ways than we were in Eastern Kentucky when I first started. We had sites, but they were not ready. They were not ready. And I'll tell you about what I mean by that. Labor, it's the most important asset you have. It's the absolute most important asset you have. Our coal miners are a gem. They are highly skilled, highly trained, dedicated employees. If you ask most of them if they're that, they'll tell you no. And so we know better. And so the idea was, how do we market that? And so we, we, we monikered the idea of available skilled workforce in Eastern Kentucky. Because we had 12,500 highly skilled, highly trained employees that could be repurposed for something else. And I know you have that here. Our response team, how do you work together to move ahead? And then aggressive marketing. Uh, the secretary spoke about marketing. You know, many people say marketing, they think about advertising in a magazine. That's not what it's about. It's about making sure your community is in front of prospects. And you do it in the right way. If you do these things, you will have success. And you've got to work together. And let me tell you, people didn't want to work together when I started this in Eastern Kentucky. Uh, it was very, very difficult. Everyone was working hard. Everybody's heart was in the right place, but they were all running in 20 different directions. And so how do you put those folks together to create that synergy that you need to move forward? So in site preparedness, you, you, I hope you can see this. I don't know if you can, but there's some red stars on there. And so we had a governor from Eastern Kentucky, Paul Patton, who was a great mentor of mine. And he really focused on helping us build sites. And you have those here. But what can we do with those sites? Do they have sewer? Do they have water? And not just is it there, but is there excess capacities there? And if there is, can you sell it? But the problem is, when you get a site that's available and ready, there's a thousand others across America. So how are you different? What can you sell to bring the industry to your region? Uh, so we did some, some real targeted research, and somebody will probably have to sing me down here in a minute, because um, I can talk about this all day. We'll continue to break out. But I want you to understand that you have these assets here, but you've got to move in the same direction. So what we found was that there was an opportunity in aerospace. And we, when we talked about that, people kind of laughed at us. You know, what are you going to do, build spaceships in eastern Kentucky? Uh, and aerospace is about anything that's in the air. Helicopters, airplanes, um, maintenance of those, building a park for those. And what we discovered was something interesting when we dug into the labor. But we had to really, really work. And so at Kentucky Power, which is a unit of AEP and now Map Clutch Power, we knew we had to find resources. And so we found a way to create some resources and then bring companies on board. And we raised $2 million of all private money to build One East Kentucky. And then we hired a very, very good professional who located his family in Eastern Kentucky to help us begin that aggressive marketing and continue site preparedness. So these counties that are highlighted here if you look close, it's US 23. Well, what, what are we on here, right? So it's just going north. So it's all the way up through Kentucky. We're touching West Virginia and Ohio. And we've partnered to create an aerospace corridor. And what that means is, is that these areas are certified and that they have the assets to attract aerospace industry. We believe we can do the same thing here in Virginia. Uh, so uh, we're going to be looking into that. We dug into labor 
because we knew labor was the challenge. Everywhere we went in aggressive marketing, every company, we're relocating for labor. We need workforce. We don't have skilled workforce. And we said, what if we told you you had 12,000 skilled labor? And they said, where? And we begin to tell the story. But we have to say something more than oh great, this work our workforce is awesome. <clears throat> you have to be able to show it in detail with data. And so we did an expansive labor study in the region. And what we found, look at this chart, that big blue line on the left, is that Eastern Kentucky had eight times the national average of metal uh, metal trend manufacturing skill sets. Metal fabrication. And what does that mean? How is that? Well, your miners are metal fabricators. Your miners can do this. And we took the skill sets of a roof bolter, of various skills within the coal mine, and showed how those skills transition into a metal fabrication model with eight times the national average in Eastern Kentucky of metal fabricators. That gets people's attention. I sat in front of the CEO of Boeing in St. Louis. And he looked at me and said, workforce is our biggest problem. And I said, boy, have I got a story for you. Now that doesn't mean Boeing's locating. But what he told me was, is that he couldn't get people to locate in St. Louis. So they're building manufacturing opportunities in places where people are. Well, we are a place where people are. And we have to certify those. We had 50 miners, I remember, in Pike County. And we said, how many of you can weld? Every hand in the room went up. And then we said, how many of you are certified? Only five hands stayed up. But what we did was we worked with the community college to get a five week, very fast, quick certification process for those welders. In Kansas City, they relocated 50 welders from Canada for a GMC plant because they couldn't find them in Kansas City. We got a welders abundant. We just have to figure out a way to market that. Your response team. This is the most important thing I can tell you because you can have the labor, you can have the science, but if you don't have the proper response team, you will lose projects. And you have to be willing to know who should be in the room and who shouldn't be in the room. So we had to do this. You may have to look at your county judge, as we call them in Kentucky, and say, I'm sorry you can't be in the room today because we don't need you today. And they have to be ready and willing to understand that you're making the right call. And that's very difficult. But if you don't have people in the room with a purpose, you're wasting that prospect's time. So you need to make sure you understand who's in that room and what's their pressure points and how do you relieve those pressure points. So all of that and many years and many partners brought us much success in Eastern Kentucky last year. Uh, we added over, I think, close to two-thirds of the growth in all of Kentucky last year in Eastern Kentucky. That's pretty significant. We added the first Greenfield aluminum rolling mill in 40 years in Eastern Kentucky, $1.3 billion investment, 500 jobs, $70,000 a year. And if you sit down with that CEO, he will tell you, I located because of your labor study. Now, it's not what he tells the media, but that's what he tells because that's what they had to have. And they knew that these folks could do the work. They have over 3,000 qualified applications for 500 jobs. That's significant. You can't hear that in many other communities. In Pikeville, we located Interblue, $350 million project, 875 jobs at $81,000 a year. They wanted to locate there because of the coal miners. Because what does coal miners do? They work with DC power. What's a battery? It's a DC power. So they saw the synergy. And now we had to aggressively tell the story. And there was a whole lot of moving parts, including our governor and others, that had to be very involved to make this happen. But it can happen. You can do it here. You have the sites. You have the people. We have to work together to make these things happen. So I'm probably way over on my time, and we can talk about it more in the breakout session. But I just want you to know it's possible. You can make it happen. But you have to make a lot of sacrifices, and you have to work really hard. Uh, I can tell you that our company is going to be dedicated to helping this region do these things. And we need partners. I've had a lot of great conversations with uh, uh, Steve Moray already, Steve Moray, as well as the Tobacco Commission. Uh, we've met with the governor. They're very passionate about helping us in this area, and we're very passionate about helping you in this area. Uh, so I look forward to talking with you and working with you in the future. Thank you, Brad and uh, Jenny. Good morning.
Alright, so my name is Jenny Lawton. I am a community development. My title changes pretty much every other day, I feel like. Right now I'm a program coordinator for the Community Development Hub. We are an independent nonprofit. We are not associated with any government agency or entity in the state. I think people get confused because other states have that. West Virginia doesn't. Um, a little bit about me, I actually grew up in West Virginia. I did what every single high school senior does in West Virginia, I left the state. Um, when you grow up in West Virginia and you go to high school and you're really good in math and science and you're a girl, they tell you to go be an engineer. So I went to Virginia Tech, I have two degrees in engineering, one is actually in aerospace, and then my master's is in unmanned systems. So hearing all this stuff about unmanned systems work down here really kind of excites me. Um, and then I worked for a while as a civil servant for the Navy. I actually worked on unmanned aircraft and then I decided I didn't want to do it anymore. Um, if you know anything about Virginia Tech, the, the motto there is a prosum, which is that I may serve. And that really spoke to me when I was a student there. And then when I got into the field, there wasn't an easy way to serve. So here I was spinning my wheels. I was real good, but all I was doing was the 9 to 5, or in that case, the 4.30 a.m. to 2 a.m. to 2 p.m. And I had to have a change. And so when engineers decide they don't want to be engineers anymore, I've realized this. They all go through this, like, crisis of identity, or whatever you want to call it. I ran away. I went to Haiti. Um, yeah, yeah. So that's, that's my life story. I run away and go to Haiti. Um, and I was going to go for two or three months, and actually ended up staying for almost two years. And the work down there, I was working with an orphanage, and I went down originally to teach English and science to these kids. And what happened was I got down there and everybody was hungry, so they couldn't learn. And so we taught English and we taught science, but we grew a garden. And so we made this massive garden, and then I realized somewhere around month 16 down there, I'm going to be way more effective if I go home and try to do this work. And so that's what brought me back to West Virginia. And I was in AmeriCorps Vista for several years. I worked as an extension agent. And then I ended up in McDowell County. So I live in McDowell County. I work for the Hub. And I'm going to tell you a little bit about some of our programs. And I'm actually ending with McDowell County. So I can go on forever there since I live there. All right, so even in my own state, when you ask people what the Hub does, you get probably 5,000 different answers. Um, I'm not going to read these slides to you, but what we, we don't do direct economic development. What we do is we do the grassroots community organizing and community development and policy work to get our communities ready for everything that these three guys are doing. So we come in and we work in communities that are low resourced. They're the medium to low resource. We're not in the Charlestons, we're not in the Huntingtons, we're not in the Roanokes of the world. We're in these rural communities that in most cases, we're dependent upon one economy. Um, of course, in the southern part of the state, it's coal. In the middle part of the state, it's chemicals or textiles and so forth. Um, and so we work to try to help communities reinvent themselves. Um, and then we also work to change the narrative of West Virginia as a whole. Um, anytime you've seen West Virginia on the news recently, unless it was with Anthony Bourdain, it's not been a good story. It's been a very negative story. And so we're working really hard to try to change that. But then there's a lot of good stuff in West Virginia. And then I think the, the biggest thing that we get credited with is we shove people in a room and force them to talk to each other, which is super important, as we'll get to some of my examples. And then I have three examples where the hub has intentionally listened and then acted, and then, um, and then kind of handed it back to the community, or we worked with the community to hand it back. And although I'm an engineer and I love, love, love numbers, I'm telling stories today because I think that's what resonates with people. All right, so the first thing that we do is we look at economic development from a sector perspective. So we don't necessarily say, oh, the hub's going to work with our partners in Logan, West Virginia to redevelop Logan. What we say is, what are our economic development sectors that are viable, and who do we have partnerships with? Um, the hub is almost 10 years old at this point, and for the first five years, the hub's expertise, because of who the executive director was and who the people working there was, was in vacant and abandoned property. 
However, when they were going around to communities and hosting community meetings, things kept coming up about agriculture. Things kept coming up about local food. Things kept coming up about how do we help our community start a farmer's market, even. And you'll learn as you start to do economic development in smaller communities, the farmer's market is generally the first seed of, of hope. And then everything comes from a farmer's market. So we had communities that wanted to do this work. Um, and we heard it five, six, seven, eight thousand times, it seemed like. And so what the hub did was they pulled together, they listened and they heard that. They pulled together a group of partners and said, all right, West Virginia Department of Ag, all right, two extension agencies, all right, farmers, what do you need? And so they built this, what, this independent nonprofit, which is the West Virginia Food and Farm Coalition, out of these listening sessions that the hub had done in probably 30 rural communities at the time, and then about five that were considered kind of smaller city communities. And they built this entire organization, and so now that organization is holding the work of policy and advocacy work around local food in the state. It's also holding the work of coordinating a beginning farmer program with all the other beginning farmer entities in the state. And it's holding the work of helping push the state forward and into having agriculture actually as a viable economic sector. And so we sort of joke that, you know, although the hub doesn't directly do economic development work, we sure do seed a lot of it. Um, and I kind of pun on intended, it started with agriculture, but we now have, we have an a, a abandoned properties coalition that works specifically just on abandoned properties in these communities and works just on creating groups of people to help deal with all of the falling down structures in West Virginia, which is pretty awesome. I'm not sure what our next sector is going to be to take on. We're thinking manufacturing because that seems to be what's sort of bubbling up from our communities. All right, so to talk about a more specific community. So Grafton is my middle resource community example. Um, if you've ever heard of Grafton, West Virginia, it's where Mother's Day was born. So that is what people know about it. It's also an old rail town. Um, Grafton is a small community in Taylor County. Uh, they were one of the hub's very first program participants in one of our programs called Turn This Town Around. And Turn This Town Around is a program specifically for communities who have identified we have a problem, come help us solve our problem. And so Grafton said, we have zero businesses. We have zero people living in our town limits. We have a dead downtown, come help. And so as part of Turn This Town Around, you would end up with $10,000 in mini grant money, which is not a lot. You end up with expertise coming to help you. You end up with a group of people that will help facilitate the community pulling its people together. So we're not the ones knocking on doors, but we're the ones that are helping these communities learn how to knock on doors to get their people to come to meetings and to come and make a plan and et cetera, et cetera, and so on. So in Grafton, they started with, why don't we just throw a party downtown? They took this entire vacant downtown, turned it into a street fair, had to have businesses from other counties come and actually do pop-up shops because Grafton had no businesses. And that was three and a half years ago. Um, we placed an AmeriCorps Vista there. She's actually from Grafton, so that helped significantly. And what she ended up doing was taking that one day event and turning it into this series of 12 events over the course of a year. So in her first year, they had monthly events like that. And then they ended up doing, in October, they of course did a haunted house that raised $15,000. I do have, I have never seen a haunted house do that, but in Grafton it does. Um, and so she worked really, really hard to just sort of trick them into doing economic development work. You know, your haunted house raised $15,000. That's not a small chunk of change. That's, that's a significant amount in a month. And so, what happened was over the course of two or three years, the community started to see, oh, money's coming in. We need to figure out a way to kind of encourage this. And so the group that formed, which they called themselves All Aboard Grafton, purchased this very large row of buildings downtown. They've been working on renovating them one at a time. And then this past, between January 1st of this year and February 1st of this year, six businesses opened in a 30-day period in downtown Grafton, which is amazing if you think about it. But what had to happen for that to happen 
was all of these people had to get together and come to coalition and build, and they had to get the mayor on board, and they had to work within the boundaries that everybody was given, and there had to be somebody there that was listening and responding to every single concern that everybody had along the way. All right, so McDowell County is my home right now. Um, if you know anything, how many of you guys have seen McDowell County on the news? Yep, yep, right? Okay, so we can start with, this is my very extremely low resourced example. Um, we can start with the bad news. So McDowell County, of course, is up on the news for being the poorest county in the country, or the third poorest, depending on which set of statistics you look at. It's the most unhealthy community, or the most unhealthy county in the country, et cetera, et cetera, so on. It's also known as the free state of McDowell, because at one point, McDowell itself tried to secede from the United States. So, it's an interesting culture. Um, I'm not native to there, I've been there for about a year and a half, but before that I was working in and out of the county for four years before that, so I got to know everybody. Um, the other interesting thing about McDowell County is it's never known anything but coal. It's known coal and it's known government subsidy. And so, when people come into McDowell and they say, oh, we're gonna start an entrepreneurship program, or we're gonna switch to agriculture, or what about a solar farm? McDowell County just stares at them because they don't actually know what any of these things are or what they actually mean. Um, McDowell County's population was almost 100,000 in 1950. Today, it's hovering around 19,000. And so in 75 years, we've lost a huge chunk of our population and a huge chunk of our, I call it the thought capital, so we've lost all of our engineers, we've, everybody left with the mines left. Um, and so in McDowell County, the hub has been working for nine years to try to get traction. So McDowell County was the hub's very first blueprint community, and what blueprint community is is this program that comes in and helps you come up with a plan for your downtown, and then they give you money to implement that plan, which is amazing in theory. And so the hub goes in, they go through the project planning process, and the hub leaves with, they leave the plan, they leave the money, and three years later, nothing had happened. And so the hub kind of said, well, let's mark that one in the failure column, Let's try again with something else. And so on and so on. The hub actually, McDowell County has participated in every program that the hub has offered with very limited success. And so the hub's, in other places, we sort of look at that and say, well, it was a failure, let's, let's give up. You know, let's try again when we get our ducks in a row. In McDowell County, what the hub said was, let's sit down and intentionally look at what's going on here. Let's listen and let's see what's happening. And so McDowell County, a little team from McDowell County actually helps the hub write a program, which is, we call it Innovation Acceleration Strategy. It was a power project to help our Southern Coalfields communities get ready to have their own power projects, essentially. So to get ready for this economic development that was supposed, that was supposed to come and supposed to happen as a result of the ARC power allotment. And McDowell County helped write this. The hub received the funding. McDowell County goes through the process, and yet again, they have many grants. There, it was like pulling teeth to get McDowell County to participate, even though they wrote the program. And so, at that point, the hub was like, the hub said, "Oh my gosh, you know, this is a huge failure. What do we do now?" And you know, it's on both parts. It's McDowell County tends to not show up. There, there's a lot of things going on there. And so, the ARC program director for West Virginia, the then Earl Bull, the hub person, or the hub director, and then myself, I was still with Extension at the time, we sat down and we started looking, why did this fail? And so what happened was they were talking about, you know, this person, this person, this person, and it was all, I realized immediately, it was all the same family, okay? And so, the same family had been participating in the programs from the beginning. And it's a very loud family as far as development work, and I see chuckles because I feel like we've all dealt with this. It's a very large personality of sorts. Like the whole family is a large personality. And so 
I sat there and I said, you guys never found the quiet voices. You, know, you guys never found the people that were missing from that table. So let's go find the quiet voices and ask them what needs to happen here. And so for the past year and a half of my life, I have been trying to find these quiet voices in McDowell County. And it's been met with some, I, I have had, our government has come against me, individuals have come against me, but I'm a stubborn human being. The hub is pretty stubborn or they would have left nine years ago, I think. And so what we're trying to do there is just listen to these quiet voices. And so we built, we had a coalition that was called the Healthy Lifestyles Task Force. It, the word task force makes me think I'm going to be arrested for not eating carrots, right? Um, and so they changed their name and now they're actually acting in coalition. And so I'm sitting at this meeting and I'm thinking, okay, let's pick one thing. And so they're going, okay, let's host a 5K. And I'm going, okay, that's great. And I'm thinking we're just gonna host two or three a year, it's gonna be great, it's a good jump off point. These insane people decided they wanted to host one a month. And I think they're nuts. And I'm sitting here going, okay. And sure enough, it's been working. And so that was my lesson for myself that maybe I need to be a quiet voice sometimes. Um, and so every month they host a 5K, and that doesn't sound like much, but in a community where there's never been anything to do and there's never been this sense of community, this is a big deal. We now have one farmer's market that's operating in Welch, and we're getting ready to open one in Jaeger, which is another small community, um, which those came as a direct result of people saying, we want something here. And so I think that's the story. The story with McDowell is like, sometimes you do have to lean as far into your failures and figure out why they were your failures before you just decide to give up and walk away. Um, and so it's slowly working. I can now say I have as many successes as failures, which is good. Um, hopefully we start to balance that out even a little more. Um, and then the other thing that I was to kind of impress upon people is don't forget about your kids. Um, most of my energy in McDowell is coming from this age group of 16 to 30. And so they're the ones that are going to hold this work. They're the ones that are trying to figure out how to stay in this community. So let's let them dictate what happens. Um, so we have a group of high school kids that are growing in the greenhouse. And they said, well, we want to sell this stuff, but we don't know how to have a business. I mean, none of us have business. None of us have parents who have businesses. And so what they were ending up having was you know, their parents had worked in the coal mines. And so everybody had always worked for somebody. So nobody had ever held the work themselves. And so we had to connect them with folks out of Legal Aid of West Virginia who were tasked with helping with some of this community development law stuff. And so they've come down and they've said, okay, this is how you start your business. This is what's happening. This is the safety net available for you. Because failure is a big thing for these kids. In their head, they're gonna fail once and then it's all over with. And they said, okay, here's the safety net. And so by illustrating that there was a safety net, these kids are all jazzed about this. And so we now have a youth cooperative that's forming that'll have, I think once it finally gets formed, we'll probably have five youth businesses under it just to get started. And so the hope is that that will just keep growing and these kids will actually get to revitalize their economy as well. Um, I think that's I think, that's I think we're gonna have to yeah. Um, yeah, I to stop right now. Thank you.